All right, hello everyone and welcome to virtual AC Day One Skincare Tips for Beginners. We are thrilled you're here and we are so excited to kick off the fall semester with you. We have a ton of exciting free events for you today and all the details can be found on the Algonquin College Orientation website. We'll add the link to the chat for you. So my name is Leanne, I am the events programmer. Before we get started, I'm gonna share a couple of housekeeping items. We ask that you please keep your microphone muted during the presentation. However, we encourage you to keep your camera on for some face-to-face -face time. Along the bottom of the screen, you will find a button entitled chat. Feel free to use this feature to introduce yourself and let us know what program you're in. If you have any questions for the event facilitators, you can also type them here in the chat. So to kick off the skincare tips for beginners information session, we're gonna give away two gift cards to Connections, the campus store. All you have to do is open up the chat and in a couple of seconds, we're gonna give everyone a fun question to answer. We would like you all to answer the question by typing in the chat, but please wait to press send until we say so because we're all gonna send our answers at the same time. Okay, so the question is, what is your skin type? And if you don't know the answer, you just wanna take a guess, that's totally fine. But just remember to wait to press send until we say so. So I'll give time for people to type it. And again, the question is, what is your skin type? Give everyone a couple more seconds to type their answer. And I'm gonna count down from three and we'll all send our answers at the same time. So three, two, one, send. Okay, I see oily, I see dry, I see a combination, sensitive skin, such a variety. But thank you so much uh, for everyone to share their answer. Um, and today we are joined by a special member of the Algonquin College Executive Team, Laura Stambra. Vice President, Student Services, who will be selecting two students who participated at random. Vice President Laura Stambra, may you please introduce yourself and announce who the lucky students are. Thank you, it's great to be here and sorry if you saw me uh, moving around on my screen. I was actually, uh, my battery was super low because the last session I attended was uh, how to better workspace. So I actually relocated rooms and set up my office somewhere else, but I forgot to plug in my computer. Um, anyways, I digress. Just a big welcome to everyone. Uh, so nice to see so many folks here, and I'm sure you've been in other sessions today, like your program orientation and some of these great activities that are, are going on. Um, just uh, we recognize that it is a very different uh, type of semester that you know none of us anticipated and uh, making the best we can and so it's uh, you'll see lots of activities online activities this coming year and really encourage you to continue participating uh, learning uh, making connections with people and um, and and um, enjoying uh, I also want to thank you it's uh, for choosing us uh, my husband makes fun of me when I say that he says you sound like um, uh, like you work for the airlines. Uh, thanks for flying with so-and-so, but really do mean it when I say thank you for choosing us. You have a lot of choice and we really appreciate that you've chosen Algonquin and uh, we hope you won't regret your decision. I certainly didn't when I joined here almost 10 years ago, but I do remember when I joined just the, the, the feeling of uh, being out of my comfort zone. And so if you're feeling that today, don't worry. Uh, I think it's pretty normal to feel that way, but I think you'll quickly learn as I did that, um, you know, being part of the Algonquin family and being here learning is a great experience and there's lots of caring people, and lots of caring hands. So just don't hesitate to reach out and connect with people along the way. Uh, that's what we're here for and we enjoy supporting you through your journey. So with that, I know you wanna learn more about your skin. I was gonna reply, my skin's wrinkly, but <laughs> that's, that's just me. Um, anyways, uh, just before we go, go forward, I know I need to select two people. So I'm going to go into the chat and uh, see, uh, just take a, take a, a little look here. Um, so I'm gonna say Marina Sath. Sath, and the last name is spelled S-H-A-A-T-H. -A -A You're one of our $50 uh, recipients from our, for our bookstar connections. And Evan Jones, you'll be our second one. So congratulations, enjoy, and uh, but particularly enjoy your semester uh, here with us at Algonquin. Take care. 
Thank you, Laura, and congratulations to the two winners. We do have more giveaways going on all day on the Algonquin College Student Services social media pages, so be sure to give them a follow and check out all the ways you can win. We would now like to welcome Shannon Ranger, One Fine Beauty founder and owner, to lead us through the Skincare for Beginners workshop. Shannon has worked in the beauty industry for over 21 years and is one of Ottawa's elite makeup artists. Shannon has an impressive portfolio with clients featured on TV and all across the province. One Fine Beauty was founded eight years ago and has grown to employ 13 talented makeup artists. We are so lucky to have Shannon join us today. Shannon, over to you. Just having a minor connection issue. Shannon will be back with us shortly. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yes, uh, Leanne, thank you so much for having me today. Um, thank you for that introduction as well. So, yes, my name is Shannon Ranger. I am the owner and founder of One Fine Beauty. Um, I have had my little company here for eight years, and um, primarily what we do is makeup, but what goes hand in hand with makeup, obviously, is skin and skincare. Uh, so hopefully I can take you on a little journey today and kind of demystify some of this, because I know, generally speaking, people tend to have a lot of questions about skincare and, you know, what, what works well for you, what won't work well. Um, yeah, so we'll head on to the next slide, Anna. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so this is just a little bit of background. Um, I did study at Versailles Academy. It is a beauty school in Ottawa, and um, that was 21 years ago because, funny enough, uh, Algonquin did not have a makeup or aesthetics program way back when, so that is where I went. Um, but then I continue my education all the time, uh, at least once a year I take a course either in Canada or the U.S., um, just to kind of keep my skills up. And uh, I have done makeup for some pretty um, awesome people, I would say. I've worked with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, the Olympians, um, Canadian Olympians, uh, Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer. I've done a lot of work on TSN. I've worked for Cirque du Soleil uh, and just a whole bunch of other things. I was a regular um, guest host on CTV Morning Live for a couple of years, so that was fun too. So on to my next slide. Oh, there, and there's some of the work. So that was for Zoomer Magazine, um, and then we also, that image in the center there, that was the official flag bearing image for uh, Tessa and Scott for when they were the um, flag bearers at the 2018 Winter Olympics. The next slide. And then these, are, these shots are actually uh, new campaign work that I just did for Nivea. So that's kind of work that we, it's kind of ongoing, but that's pretty fun for us too. So next slide. Okay, so the first thing that we ask when, um, you know, determining whether it's makeup or skincare for somebody is, what is your skin type? And I saw a lot of great, uh, you know, answers on the side. Some people were like, I don't know, it's skin or oily combination. Um, so yeah, so the, the way we kind of get to that answer is we tend to ask um, our clients, or you need to ask yourself, some kind of open-ended questions. So questions that can't be answered with a yes uh, or a no. So how does your skin feel in the morning? Like when you wake up, does it feel tight? Does it feel oily? Like do you just feel fine and normal? So that's one question. How does your skin feel after a shower? Is it like tight and itchy or is it totally okay? Uh, do you get shiny throughout the day? A lot of times people will tell us, oh my goodness, I have like the most oily skin. And then I'll say, okay, so like by 10 a.m. you're blotting oil off your face? And they'll say, no, no, like no, like maybe by end of the day, I'm like, okay, that's, that's not oily. That's much more, just more, you know, combination, maybe even normal skin. Does your skin react easily? So this can be caused by so many things, but definitely it can be caused by, you know, the products that you use, um, the environment, certain medications, all sorts of things can cause reactions. And then the last question I kind of ask is, do you really have any concerns with regards to your skin? Some people will say, uh, nope, I just want, you know, to not be flaky, or I just want my makeup to last longer, do, you know, or other people will say, I have concerns, like, with aging and wrinkles. So there's, there's many different avenues we can kind of go down, but we'll get more into that later. So next slide. Okay, so for this slide here, this is just a cross-section of the skin, and I 
put this in only because I think it's really interesting when we are shopping for uh, skincare, there's a lot of big claims out there, a lot of wild claims when it comes to um, companies and, and how they market their skincare. And a lot of it is really just that. It's a lot of it's marketing ploys. So when we're looking at skincare, uh, we want to know how far does skincare penetrate or how far does it absorb? So penetrate means how far is it actually going to sink into the skin? Um, and then absorb is, you know, it goes even further, like it can reach the bloodstream. So um, really, when you're looking at skincare that you're going to find just kind of at the drugstore, it's not going any further than the epidermis. Uh, if you want anything to reach the dermis, that's when you're getting more uh, into your kind of medical grade skincare. And even at that, that's more looking at like injectables and whatnot. So when skincare makes um, skincare companies make big claims that, you know, use this and your wrinkles are going to be gone in, you know, three to four weeks. But the chances of that happening um, are probably pretty slim, but it's not to say it won't happen, but it, it, you really have to look at the active ingredients and, and see, you know, what ingredients they are telling you are going to make that happen. So the long and the short of it, we'll talk about anti-aging a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, I would, I would be very hesitant if a skincare company is telling you that it's going to, you know, make wild changes with regards to skin texture, but we'll get, we'll get onto that later. So on to the next slide. Okay, so here are our six common skin types. So normal skin is, you know, just pretty much what it sounds like. So it's going to have a medium thickness and healthy coloring. So it's not going to be red and splotchy. It's not going to have much irritations. You really don't have many concerns. You don't feel like you get overly, um, you don't get overly oily in the day and you're not really overly dry. You're just kind of anything works on your skin. These are the people I would say that can wash their face with like a bar of soap and use hand cream on their face and they don't have any issues. Those people make me jealous. I am not that person. <laughs> My skin is incredibly finicky, but those people do exist. They're kind of like the unicorns of skincare, but hey, that's amazing for them. So the next one is dry skin. So dry skin, it's pretty much what it sounds like. So it's more of like a matte or flat surface to the skin. It can sometimes look a little bit dull. The skin usually has small pores and is thin. You can see everything kind of happening under the skin, like the broken capillaries. There's wrinkles, flakiness. The big thing with dry skin is that this is mostly, I would say, caused by genetics. If you genetically have dry skin, um, it's kind of hard to undo that. But I mean, age can be a factor because, you know, loss of moisture, loss of collagen, those types of things can contribute to dry skin as well, but also diet, harsh cleansing products, and environment as well. So dehydrated. So the way I like to you know, describe these, because these sometimes are used interchangeably, and that's not really correct, um, is that dehydrated is usually what we do to our skin, we'll end up with dehydrated skin. Dry skin is you were just born with dry skin. So dehydrated skin, that's definitely um, a lack of moisture on the surface, so you're going to have flakiness and wrinkles. Um, it's going to feel tight and itchy, and a little bit thin as well. This can definitely be caused by diet, age, illness. Medications is a big one for dehydrated skin. Improper cleansing, but this is where environment's really going to, you know, um, have a big part too. So like indoor heating, air conditioning, and whatnot. So we'll see this a lot in, uh, well, in schools. Definitely can happen. Also, um, office buildings, you know, just kind of like recycled air. If you're in there all day, you can really get some dehydrated skin going on. So next slide. So the next one is oily. So this one's pretty self-explanatory as well. So shiny, oily surface to the skin. The skin tends to be thicker as well. Um, large pores or blackheads. And this truly is caused by genetics, you know, diet and environment. Sensitive skin, this is where I fall into. This is the most finicky of skins. Um, this and acneic probably. Uh, and this one here just wants to react to everything, um, right down to touch, making me touch sensitive as well. So the skin has redness and or inflammation and is usually pretty thin. It reacts easily to skincare or the elements. It can be caused by allergies, mood, stress, an imbalance 
uh, in the amount of oil the skin produces. Um, so that's kind of a tricky one to, to deal with. Um, and then there's acneic skin. And this one typically has, you know, blackheads or whiteheads, inflammation, pores, and a shinier surface tends to be caused by genetic stress diet medications, poor digestion, and improper cleansing. And what's important to note with acneic skin is that we know just health-wise in general that um, a healthy gut can help promote, you know, just general overall health and wellness throughout our entire body but we do know that some imbalances in the gut can sometimes show up in our skin as well so i mean if you're really having a problem with with acne and we'll get more into that later um sometimes even looking further deep into the gut to see if you can resolve any of those issues can help um somewhat clear the skin as well so one thing that's not listed here is combination because combination is a combination of any two or any three so we always used to think of combination skin as um, oily and normal, or oily T-zone and dry cheeks. Well, no, like, I mean, you could be sensitive acneic and you technically are still a combination skin. So um, sometimes you need to kind of, um, you know, treat each area or each condition. It's not unusual to have to do that. Skincare really is not one size fits all. So yeah, sometimes it might be a little bit annoying. You might have to use, you know, a cleanser here, but then a toner only in your T-zone. But that's, uh, we'll get more into that after as well. Okay, so next slide. This is just a little, you know, clip of exactly what we're gonna be looking at here. So cleansers, toners and exfoliators, moisturizers, eye creams, sunscreens, masks, anti-aging and acne treatments. All right, next slide. This slide is probably my favorite slide because I feel like there's little tidbits of information in here that, you know, people might not know. Uh, and I do love, I do love educating and teaching about this stuff. So this little jar that you see uh, on your screen, this is your PAO symbol. So this stands for period after opening. And it just means that your product, once it's open, is going to remain stable and safe to use if stored in proper conditions. So to use it by the, the amount of months listed there. So this one here would stand for six months. Um, but the period after opening and an expiration date are two different things. Expiration date um, means this is how long a product is going to be good for completely unopened. Because the minute you open a product, the minute you touch a product, all those contaminants are going to begin to degrade your product. Uh, therefore, you should switch over from your expiration date over to your period after op opening date. And the period after opening date, it's, it's funny. I know in Canada, I I don't believe it's a mandated uh, like requirement to list it. It's kind of like a nice to know, not a need to know. Um, but I do truly think it, it should be one of those things that, that is listed on all packaging. So if you don't see it on your, I have some packages here, just to some products here I'm just quickly looking at. If you don't see it listed on your actual primary packaging, which is the container that the product you know, actually is in, um, then it might be on the secondary packaging. So it might be on the box. So before you throw the box out, take a quick peek. Um, and then I always just keep in my bathroom um, just a fine tip Sharpie. And I just, uh, I'll just label my products, you know, when I opened it. So I know how many months until I should discard it. And I always tell people, you know, take this information and do, do what you will with it. But when it comes to like skincare products and products that are like around the eyes, I truly do um, think that it's important to follow these guidelines. When you're dealing with powder products and like non aqueous based products, so not cream, not emollient, I mean, if you're dealing with an eyeshadow or a pressed powder, you can probably fudge it a little bit unless it's sunscreen. But when it comes to like cleansers and eye creams and even mascara and whatnot, I would definitely uh, follow, the, follow the instructions and, and toss it when, when it's kind of best before period is over. Okay, next slide. Okay. Perfect. So cleansers, obviously the very first step in skincare. Um, and like I said, so cleansers, just like the rest of our skincare, is not one size fits all. So if you have a drier skin, you're probably going to want to look for more of a cream or milk-based cleanser. So it's not going to strip the skin. It's going to, you know, be emollient and it's going to um, help to repair the lipid barrier, which is going to help to alleviate any type of tightness or dryness or itching that you'll have in your skin. 
oilier skins tend to fare really well with more gel-based or more purifying cleansers. Um, but you know, you don't want to use something that's too stripping on the skin. So if you use it a few times and you feel like, hmm, you know what, I feel like it's giving me that really squeaky, squeaky clean feeling. Um, if you dry out the skin too much and you're oilier, your skin's just going to end up overproducing oil. So you can maybe reserve that cleanser to use like once a day and then use something else for your other, um, you know, if you're using it in the morning, maybe use something else at night. Oil-based cleansers are amazing. They are just starting now to get the credit that they deserve. They emulsify once you add a little bit of water to them. Um, so they don't turn fully into a lotion type cleanser, but they're great for all skin types, even oily skin. Um, and I know when I used to work, um, I used, actually used to work at MAC Cosmetics for a long time. I was there for 10 years and I was a trainer with them for six years. So I trained all product knowledge and um, new, anyways, I did a lot, I did all their trainings for them. So oil cleansers, it's important to know that oil on a molecular level with oily skin, oil will remove oil. So it's, it's a really great cleanser for an oilier skin. Um, if you're a makeup wearer, just please be sure that your cleanser states that it removes all makeup because not all cleansers remove makeup. Um, and then the last part there about wipes. Wipes are not a suitable like primary daily cleanser. So they're great in a pinch. Absolutely keep them at your nightstand. You have a late night or very early morning, <laughs> you know, definitely use them to remove your makeup because they're better than nothing. Um, but definitely they're not really a true piece of the skincare uh, kind of schedule, I would say. And also they're really bad for the environment. Okay, next slide. Thank you so much, Shannon. Before yeah. we move on, we do have a question. Um, is yeah. diluted coconut oil a suitable cleanser? So it depends on the type of coconut oil. So coconut oil is actually very high on what we call the communogenic scale. So it actually um, it actually can clog pores quite a bit. So it depends if it's fractionated or not fractionated. Um, so yeah, it would really depend on digging a little bit deeper with the brand that you're using. And um, yeah, and kind of, and go from there and maybe just do a little bit more research. It's not really a blanket answer, I'm sorry, <laughs> but yeah. I know, I know coconut oil is a popular one. And there's another question in the chat um, that's about eczema. So this student yeah. has eczema on their hands and their face and yeah. was recommended by a skin doctor to avoid all strong lotions and creams. They find For wearing sure. makeup is hard. Um, so they've kind of determined they have sensitive and dry skin. Is there any recommendations where they should search for better products or where to go to start? So this is my kind of... Um, overall suggestion when it comes to skincare in general is bland, bland, bland. Unless you really need some targeted products for anti-aging or anything like that, keep it bland. So for uh, eczema, for rosacea, um, just reactive skin in general. Now eczema can be some sort of an autoimmune issue. So I mean, it, 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 there might be other ways to control it other than just, just the products you're putting on your skin, but definitely my favorite brand would be something like CeraVe. Um, I know Cetaphil gets recommended a lot. I'm not a fan of Cetaphil. The ingredient deck is not really something I want to put on my skin, but CeraVe is a really great line, widely available, very cost effective. You can get it at Walmart or Shoppers Drug Mart. And again, it's just, it's great for hydrating, it's non-irritating, it's loaded with hyaluronic acid. So, um, so yeah, so it's gonna really inject like a lot of water um, and hydration into the skin. Thank you so much. And I'm yeah. gonna ask one more question and there's about five or six or so, but they are all listing different products and wondering if they're good. Okay. So it is um, natural oils. Yep. Um, miss, oh, micellar water? water? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, using a face brush or a face loofah, argan oil, okay. uh, or St. Ives. Okay, so I'm just opening the chat here just because I wanted to see what kind of context this was all in. Um, so natural oils for cleansing. I, use, I don't usually use natural oils for cleansing. I'll use like a, a cleansing oil that's actually been formulated to be used on the skin. Um, so I can't really help there, but I mean, in terms of like natural oils to apply to the skin afterwards, 
Um, a cold pressed organic rosehip oil is really nice and generally very well tolerated. Um, Squalane is a derivative of olive oil. It's another great um, emollient or hydrator for the skin. Um, let's see here, is micellar water good? Yeah, micellar water is great. Um, great to use with a cotton pad and swipe over the face. Um, the thing is, is I'm, I like rinsing my cleansers off. So if you're going to use a micellar water, I still like to use a bit of tepid water afterwards just to remove it. Is witch hazel a good cleanser or toner? Witch hazel is a great toner provided it's, it's suitable for your skin type. So if you have more of a normal or oily skin, witch hazel can be fantastic for that. Um, is using a face loose cut or face brush good every day or once a week? Okay, so that would fall into exfoliating. We're going to get to that next, but I don't think I have a timeline of when you should do that. But exfoliating, you can do about one, like, so you can do it every like two to three days, but you kind of have to work up to that point. Um, and I, in terms of face brush, you have to be really gentle with brushes, any type of product, like a Clarisonic or um, a Foreo, all those types of exfoliating like gadgets. You just have to be really, really gentle with the skin and do not press too hard. But generally speaking, so long as you keep the brush itself clean and you're cleaning it and you're letting it dry out between uses, because if not, it's just going to harbor bacteria. And then that's just going to throw you into a different category, which is probably acneic, and that's not going to be good. I really like argan oil, which I know is great for making skin smooth. Can it be used as an like oil cleanser? Again, you'd have to, it would, it's not just as simple as putting some argan oil on your hands and rubbing it and using it as a cleanser. Um, you really want to make sure that, that it's going to be, you know, suitable to be used for that. So I don't really have, I don't really have an answer for that one. I apologize, but argan oil is fantastic as a moisturizer. Is St. Ives a good brand? Um, I would skip St. Ives if it's with regards to the face scrub, and we'll talk about that in my next slide. Um, yeah, my cellar water is a makeup remover. Yes, perfect, great. And my favorite one for that is um, Bioderma, Sensi Bio, H2O. It is like the gold standard when it comes to my cellar water. Another good kind of second, I would say, is uh, Garnier. Okay, we're gonna get more into this stuff after. So, okay, how about we go back into the presentation and I'll answer all that, all those kind of questions after. Sounds good, thank you so much. Okay, okay, so toners. Toners, um, now we saw that question about witch hazel, that is a great option for a toner if needed. Traditionally, they used to be used as a second step in the skincare routine because they would be required to stop the cleansing process of, um, of the cleanser. So, I mean, back in the, I don't know, I'm gonna say like 80s and earlier, you know, we use a lot of cold cream cleansers Well, we needed something to stop the cleansing process and normalize the pH of the skin. So now we see more, we do see some toners, but usually you can kind of skip them without issue. Uh, alternatively, this is a great time to use an exfoliant. Uh, an exfoliant is gonna help to remove any dead skin cells and allow your moisturizer to really do its job. So chemical exfoliants would be an AHA, which is an alpha hydroxy acid, or DHA, which is a beta hydroxy acid. I'll explain the differences later. The other option would be a physical exfoliant. So physical exfoliant is like your face scrub. Um, so going back to the St. Ives, I wouldn't use St. Ives apricot scrub. When I think of face scrubs, um, I think of high school and using St. Ives. And the only thing with that is when you're using something with a natural ground nut shell, you're gonna cause microscopic tears to the skin. Um, there have actually been class action lawsuits against St. Ives for this face scrub. So there are other products, I'm sure they're fantastic. I'm sure they're great, but I would just avoid the scrub. It is way too abrasive for the skin. But a physical exfoliant, um, you can, you know, just read the packaging. Anything that kind of has more of like a universally shaped, like a round type of bead to it, uh, that that would be great as an exfoliator. Uh, and yeah, they're just going to help to remove the dead skin cells because our skin replenishes um, every 28 days, and sometimes we just need a little extra help to get those dead skin cells off. And we'll move on to the next slide. Moisturizers, okay. So super important step. Uh, and sometimes it can be difficult to find the right one. You know, sometimes they might be too greasy. Sometimes they're not hydrating enough. Um, but we really want our moisturizers to give us a nice dose of hydration, a big drink of water, and help to replenish the lipid barrier. So that's the barrier that obviously has all like the natural oils in our skin. Um, so all skin types need a moisturizer, even if you're oily, because everybody needs water. You might not need oil 
You might not need lipids too much in your uh, moisturizer if you are oily, but you definitely need water. And that's actually going to help to alleviate your oily skin because it's going to put your skin more in balance, which is what we want. So there are so many factors to consider when choosing your moisturizer. What type of formula do you prefer? Do you like a cream? Do you like a lotion? Do you like a cream gel? Oils? I'm a big fan of oils. Do you wear makeup? If so, you want something that's going to work well with your foundation. Because if you are choosing, um, right now, silicone-based foundations are, are very, very popular. So it's very hard to get something that's not silicone-based. So if you're going to use a water-based moisturizer and a silicone-based foundation, you might get some separating or breaking of your foundation uh, throughout the day. And then do you want SPF in your moisturizer? Or do you want to apply it as like an extra step? Because not everybody likes to be committed to SPF every day. I'm one of those people. Um, so yeah, so sometimes do you want it in your moisturizer or do you just want to choose something um, separately? And we'll get into SPF, I think. That's next. Okay, next slide. Oh, eye creams, okay. Um, definitely one of the commonly missed uh, steps in skincare. Um, the skin around the eyes is super, super delicate. So we wanna make sure that you really do kind of pamper it and baby it and it is never too early to start using one. So like I said, even if you use just a super bland, kind of nothing super exciting, CeraVe is my favorite. It's called the Eye Repair Cream. Um, and it's again, just gonna help to keep that area hydrated. Uh, and that's, that's going to make all the difference going forward as we age. So one thing I want to note, though, is that sometimes people will just use their regular um, face cream as their eye cream. They're like, oh, it's emollient enough. It's heavy enough. I'm just going to slather it all around my eyes. You have to be careful in doing that because you can really create a problem. Um, these under the skin kind of keratin bumps, they're called milia. And they are a bit of a nightmare if you do get them because they're super impossible to remove on your own without doing damage. So that's why you definitely want to stick with an eye cream that is formulated to be an eye cream, to be used on that super thin skin around the eyes. And this little tidbit, I always love this telling people this because I find it so interesting. So you'll see many eye creams when they talk about um, that they are a soothing eye cream and they have deep puffing agents, they almost always have caffeine in them. And caffeine, when we use it on top of the body externally, it can really help to calm and soothe, which is totally different than when we consume caffeine, we drink a cup of coffee and it gives us energy and it makes us super hyper. So caffeine in skincare, fantastic for soothing and calming the skin. Okay, next slide. So there is just two quick questions related yeah. to eyes. Um, so yeah. one, is how often should you use eye cream? Oh, morning and night. Okay. Morning and night, both, yeah. And is argan oil one that you can use as an under eye moisturizer? Um, it would have to, it would have, it, I guess it would really depend. I don't see why not, um, but you would have to say on your actual packaging if it's tested for the eye area. You do really want to make sure that it's something that's ophthalmologist uh, tested. Awesome. Because that's the, that, because eye creams can migrate into the eyes very easily too. So that's why you need to make sure it's super safe for that area. Great, thank you, Shannon. Those are the two questions Here. related to under eyes. So we'll get back to okay. the other after. Awesome, sounds good. Okay, so sunscreen, another super important uh, and sometimes overlooked step. So obviously it should be included in your everyday routine. And if you do not include it in your everyday routine, at the very least, definitely on the days where you'll be mostly outdoors. So there are two types of sunscreen formulas. So you have your chemical and you have your physical. Your chemical sunscreens, uh, those are the ones that you're, I would say, mostly going to find in like day creams. Those are almost always, and your foundations, those are always going to have like a chemical sunscreen in it. And those chemical sunscreens actually allow the sun's rays to hit your skin. But at that point, the rays are destroyed. Uh, so the skin, yeah, so it actually does hit your skin, but you know, it's the, the sunscreen itself takes care of it at that point. So chemical sunscreen ingredients would be oxybenzone, octanoxate, avobenzone. Uh, there's a million different ones, but those are like the most popular ones. And then physical sunscreen. So these ones here sit more on the skin surface and the sun's rays cannot penetrate through them. So they kind of bounce right back. Um, so your common physical sunscreen ingredients are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. When I think of uh, physical sunscreens, I always think of um, like surfers or skiers that have like the white zinc on their nose. That is a physical sunscreen. 
So whichever you choose, just make sure you're selecting broad spectrum so that you're protected from damaging rays that are going to cause skin cancer, premature aging, and sunburn. Next slide. So there are two questions about sunscreen. The first one sure. is, um, can you recommend a sunscreen for eczema skin? Uh, yeah, I think I have it on our last slide, but if not, um, I would definitely say something. And again, you're going to have to see if you react to chemical sunscreens. Um, but the brand that I love the most, and I have very hypersensitive skin, is called Tizo. So it's T-I-Z-O. And T-I stands for titanium dioxide, and Z-O is zinc oxide. So it's called Tizo. Um, and they have a lot of great uh, different options there. So I'd probably just do like a regular untinted daily sunscreen. I think it's like an SPF 40 or 50. And then the second question is, um, the student has a face cream with SPF 25. Should yeah. she still put sunscreen on top of it? Does it, um, like, is that too much sunscreen? Or is it like, if that's 25 and her sunscreen she has on top 40, does that make it 65 SPF? No, it doesn't. So it doesn't. You'll end up being an SPF 40 at that point. It doesn't add together and be kind of like cumulative. Um, so, you know, your SPF 25 is probably fine. Uh, as a day-to-day, -day, I mean, it's probably more than most people do. Um, but the one thing we have to remember about skin or about sunscreen is that you're supposed to reapply it every after every 90 minutes in the sun. So, I mean, if you want to do that one first, and then let's say halfway throughout the day, you throw on your SPF 40. I mean, that's fine. Great, thank you. And does moisturizer go first or sunscreen first? So, sunscreen goes after moisturizer. Perfect. Thank kind you. Of seals so it all in. And then, so yeah, each formula is going to have its pros and cons. A large number of people are starting to react to chemical sunscreens. And chemical, come, sorry, chemical sunscreens, um, they're starting to become more banned in places. Um, like, like, for instance, I went to Mexico last year and you had to use something that was uh, reef safe for your sunscreen, like on your body and on your face. So it couldn't be a chemical sunscreen. It had to be a physical sunscreen. It had to be a zinc oxide or titanium dioxide blend. Um, but then for physical sunscreen, so that's your zinc and your titanium, that's a mineral sunscreen. I see somebody just asking here, what about natural mineral sunscreen? So mineral sunscreens are your physical sunscreen. They can sit on the skin. So sometimes they can be tricky for makeup application. They might make your skin kind of greasy. So you really have to kind of play around with it and find one that works well for you because if you get stuck with something you don't like, you're not going to wear it. And that's, you know, that's just no good. So I have a couple of recommendations at the end of the presentation. Um, okay, and then for most consumer brands of cosmetics foundations, they're all formulated now with SPF in it, which is a plus for, for some, um, but in order for your SPF to truly be effective, it must be applied really liberally and evenly all over the skin. So I don't, um, even if your foundation comes with SPF 15 in it, I don't totally rely on that because I don't know many people that are going, you know, top of the forehead, under the chin, side to side with their foundation. Usually we're kind of feathering it out and making it look really natural. So you should probably still wear a sunscreen in conjunction with your foundation, even if your foundation does have that SPF in it. And then I had one little question, but I don't want to spend too much time because I know we're kind of running through this quickly, but any guesses why makeup artists don't like SPF in cosmetics? Can somebody give me a rapid fire answer? I'm kind of seeing here. Bingo, Maddie, you got it on the first guess because of the white it leaves behind. Okay, so kind of, yeah. So basically when I talked about um, this physical sunscreen sitting on the skin and the sun's rays bounce off of it, the same thing can happen with camera flash. So I don't know if you've ever had, you know, a night you got your makeup done and you went out and you took all these like selfies and whatever, and then you realize anything that had a flash, you have like a super pale face. Like I would be like, you're kind of like ghostly in your pictures. That's why it's the flashback from the foundation in the SPF. Okay. All right, so next slide, please. Masks, okay, so face masks. This is definitely like a treatment type thing. Uh, you don't need to do it all the time. Some people's skin, you know, really don't enjoy doing it too, too often. So even if you do it once a week, that could be a nice treat for your skin. Um, there's not too many formulations of masks out there. The two most popular definitely are clay masks and hydrating masks. And like I was saying earlier, if you have combination skin, you absolutely can use, you know, a clay mask in the T-zone and then something more hydrating on your cheeks. That's totally fine to do that. 
So clay masks, um, kaolin clay is going to be your most popular type of clay. Um, and those really help to draw out impurities from the pores and help to control oil. They can also appear to shrink pore size, but you can't really shrink pore size. Like that doesn't, that's not really a thing to do, but you can help to dissolve any type of debris that's in the pore. So you can kind of, if you get that debris out, you will create the illusion that your pores are smaller because they're not full of stuff right? Skincare, leftover skincare, leftover makeup. Um, and clay masks are really great at helping to, to draw out all those impurities. So they really do tend to dry down on the skin, making it super tight before they're rinsed off. And then hydrating masks, they literally do exactly what they say they do. So they give a big drink of water to the skin. Uh, and depending on the formula, some are almost like a gel type of formula. You can apply them and leave them on overnight, or you can rinse it off. One thing I didn't mention here is sheet masks. Those are definitely a super popular thing right now, but in most cases, they're more of a hydrating mask that are just like in a sheet form, so they just stay on and, you know, don't slip, slip off type of thing. Okay. So next, oh yes, anti-aging. So anti-aging is a huge part of the skincare category, definitely the highest grossing category. Lots of people like to make lots of money off of, uh, you know, anti-aging. So for years, anti-aging products really were targeted for a certain demographic. So I'm going to say 40. I just turned 42 weeks ago. So I can say, yes, I can attest that this is, you know, this is what we're looking for. But it's funny that it's trickled down to all age categories now. So it's never really to, I'm seeing, you know, 20, 25 year old influencers talking about anti-aging. So really, there's no real uh, bad time to start. So, but anti-aging products are really becoming more affordable now. And brands like The Ordinary, I don't know if anybody's heard of The Ordinary, um, really do need a mention here because they have completely come in and disrupted this anti-aging industry um, because they have some of the most potent um, actives and acids and um, oils, like the essential oils I was talking about. Um, they really have a super competitive edge and most of their products are under $10. So where you look at something like Estee, Estee Lauder uh, Advanced Night Repair that might cost you $250 for a 30 mil bottle, um, you can get, I don't know, 5% lactic acid you know, from the ordinary and it's going to cost you $6.70. So in saying that, um, when you're dealing with actives and acids, you really want to be careful and you really don't want to... Uh, mess up your skin, for lack of a better word. You do not want to destroy the acid, man the acid mantle or the lipid barrier of the skin. So what I would suggest, again, with anti-aging, it is not a blanket type of situation where I say everybody needs to use lactic acid or everybody needs to use, um, you know, vandalic acid. No, what I would say is um, if you want to start with something that's really going to help all skin, from the ordinary, their hyaluronic acid is super mild. It can definitely be used for all skin types. I mean, the person there with the eczema, you might have to do some spot testing, but it's very, uh, it's a very non-reactive um, type of product or ingredient. Uh, the hyaluronic acid is wonderful. And then if you're interested in trying other actives and acids, they have a very comprehensive yet a little bit confusing website, but they have really, really great support. So you can write to them in their chat and be like, yo, your website is very confusing. I don't know where to start. This looks like a giant science project. Um, and they will definitely recommend, uh, based on your skin type, a, a few products to try. And with any products um, that are very active like this, you always want to start at the lowest concentration. So if it starts, if it comes in a 3%, you start there. You don't jump up until you know that you, your skin can tolerate it. But they're really great. And they actually started out not in the skincare field. They actually didn't even have a skincare background. They were simply scientists that believed in nanotechnology. And they thought, this is a big industry that we can kind of get into. And they are um, designed and manufactured and developed all in Toronto. And they, uh, they're definitely known on a global scale now. So very interesting company to check out. And the next slide. Okay, so this is where we talk about AHAs and BHAs. So alpha hydroxy acids, they're gonna help to dissolve, um, and it, we call it like the glue, the cellular glue that holds the dead cells, skin cells together. 
Um, and it's going to help to exfoliate those and get them off of the skin surface. This is going to allow um, for you know your products, your your actives, your acids, or your moisturizer to penetrate deeper. Um, and yeah, so it's going to help to you know it's going to help stimulating collagen production and it's going to help with the look of wrinkles. So common types of alpha hydroxy acids are glycolic acid, lactic, and mandelic acids. Uh, BHAs, this is your salicylic acid. So this is really great for somebody that deals with acneic skin. This is again going to help to dissolve dead skin cells, but they're all, it's also able to really deeply penetrate into the pore to dissolve oil and break down any debris that causes acne. So both of these are really, really great. Um, different uses though. BHA is great if you have um, finicky kind of acneic skin. Um, but AHAs are good if you're really wanting some anti-aging kind of properties. Your skin will most definitely be photosensitive, um, very sensitive to the sun, the sun sorry, when you are using um, actives and acids. So you have to make sure that you do follow up with a really great sunscreen. And next slide. Perfect. Okay, so acne treatments. Um, it really depends on the type of acne that you have, but I mean, if it's your normal kind of stress acne or hormonal acne, you know, your once a month type of thing, uh, a lot of over-the-counter products will definitely work well for you. So benzoyl peroxide is a common ingredient we hear about, so is salicylic acid. So the way I like to explain it to people is benzoyl peroxide is really great at treating a pimple that you have on the skin right now. So it's, you know, it's, it's come to the surface, it's looking really angry. Benzoyl peroxide is really great to treat that. Again, always go with your lowest concentration. Um, I'd rather an extra day or two of using a lower concentration benzoyl peroxide than really zapping it, because when you zap it with a really high concentration, you're gonna really disrupt the skin all around it, then you're gonna be, it's gonna take you a long time to heal because you're gonna be flaking and it's just gonna be not super fun. So I would definitely start with your lowest um, concentration of benzoyl peroxide. And then salicylic acid, this is something you can kind of consistently use to keep your skin looking clear because this is your ben this is your beta hydroxy acid, sorry. So it's going to help to penetrate deeper and it's going to help to like kind of tr treat and prevent. Um, cystic acne can be really difficult. And a lot of times when it comes to seeing a dermatologist or an esthetician, I actually side more with the really trained estheticians. Sometimes I know um, I've seen dermatologists quite a few times in my life for various things. And they're obviously great for um, certain skin conditions. But when it comes down to acne, I feel like my best results always come from a uh, licensed esthetician. Um, so I would say committing to regular facials, Facials are not cheap, but you also don't have to have them done all the time. I mean, seasonally or even twice a year, you treat yourself. Um, they can really help to keep the skin in check. And then for stubborn acne, that's when you might need to go to a dermatologist. You might need some sort of a medicated cream or gel. Um, and then, yeah, common ingredients used in top topical acne treatments can be a blend of retinoids. So retinoids are a type of um, like a retinol. And that's going to help to exfoliate the skin surface. And then it might be paired with an antibiotic in the same cream. And that's going to deep down uh, clean out those pores. So let's, my next slide is going to be a chart. So why don't we talk about any questions, if we do have time for questions? Yeah, Shannon. So there is two questions. There's a bunch of questions about acne, but I'm going to go back uh, to anti-aging. There's two questions about them. So oh, sure. The yeah. One is, uh, what time of day should they be applying the anti-aging creams? I prefer to do it at night because I feel like if you do it in the day uh, and then you do, ha then you'll have to be super liberal with your, uh, with your SPF. So I like to do it at night and then give the skin downtime for that active ingredient to do its job and to really work. Great. And then the second question related to um, anti-aging, um, it's about mm -hmm. the ordinary products. Are yeah. the acids natural or are they chemical? So this is always an interesting question when it comes to, uh, natural or chemical because everything's a chemical right down to the water that you drink and the air that we breathe so it's kind of like a loaded question I think what they mean is it's just kind of like a natural pure source versus chemical um, it depends what it is I mean everything is going to have gone through you know even like when it comes to squalene that's derived from olive oil they're not like extracting it straight from the olive oil. you know what I mean like there is a chemical process to it so no, I'm definitely going to say these people believe in science. So this is definitely science-based 
skincare, but you are getting um, like 100% plant derived squalene oil. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's as good as I'm, I'm a very, uh, very much a believer in, in science in terms of like skincare, because my skin does not do well with natural products people are going to tend to have more of a reaction to an essential oil applied to the skin than they are going to have something that's kind of doctored in a lab. As terrible as that sounds, and I, it's not to say natural products aren't good, they're fantastic, but just we know on a, on a wider scale that you will have more of a reaction if you just took like a plant from outside and rubbed it on your face. Like it's not, you know what I mean? There have to be controls in place. Um, so yeah, the ordinary, definitely these people are like nano technology scientists <laughs> so they definitely believe in science but um yeah so i mean you will have some like just like the the uh rosehip oil it is a cold, cold pressed organic rosehip oil so i mean it's natural but i mean it's definitely been through some sort of um i don't want to say synthesization process but anyways yeah so it's kind of like a blend of both Awesome. Thank you so much. So moving into the yeah. acne questions, a uh, student's yep. wondering how can one tell if they have acne or just occasional breakouts? So I think if you're going to say if you have acneic skin, you definitely are battling skin for more weeks of the month than you're not. Um, you might have like a poor, you know, you might have a bad week where you get it, you know, along your jawline. Jawline acne is definitely hormonal. We know that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you'll know if, if you have acne skin, like right now I'm having a crazy breakout on my forehead, but I know that that's more, um, I've had a reaction to something. So yeah, I think if you, if you constantly are battling a few large blemishes, you would probably say you have a little bit more acne skin, or you might have reactive skin. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, is yeah. tea tree oil a good um, treatment for pimples and acne? So it is, however, it is super, super strong. So I would definitely dilute it. Um, if you're going to use it on, uh, on a blemish, I would maybe put it on a Q-tip. So I would put the Q-tip in water first, and then I would put, um, and then I would put the tea tree oil on that. A brand that's really, really great that is um, tea tree oil based is Thursday Plantation. If you haven't heard of that, the price point is phenomenal. I think this cleanser and the toner is under $15. You can get it in the natural food section of, um, of the grocery store, but you can also get it at like natural food pantry and uh, places like that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, is a, I'm going to brutalize this word, a galvantic facial uh, meant to help with acne treatments? Um, I don't know too much about that. I do think they are like, I know it has something to do, like skin therapists have to do that. That's not something that you're going to do yourself. So like anything like that, any type of uh, medical grade facial, you'll definitely have to go to a licensed individual to do that. So I don't have any true feelings one way or another about galvanic. I think it's definitely going to depend on the skin and the person doing the treatment itself. Great. Thank you so much. And this one takes it a little bit away from acne, but it's in the same sort of skin condition topic. Yeah. Um, what do you recommend for people with Milia, M-I-L-I-A. Milia. Okay, so Milia, yeah, we talked about that with the eye creams. So Milia definitely has to be treated by a, I don't know if a dermatologist would do it. They might see it more just cosmetic. So I would go see um, an esthetician because they definitely will have to lance it. So that's when they use a sterilized needle, pierce the skin and extract it that way. Great. Thank you so much. And if you're going to touch on this later, we can uh, push this question, but there's a student wondering if you have Ottawa based certified estheticians that you'd recommend. Uh, I do. Um, there's a couple locations, a couple people that I really do love. So my favorite line for facials is called Alumier MD. So it's L A U M I E R M D. Um, and they, they're kind of like I was saying earlier with the natural blended with science type of skincare. So I, it's kind of like the best, uh, best of both worlds. So I really like their facials. They offer facials. Usually their estheticians should offer the facials um, with chemical peels as well or power peels. And those are really um, a great way to um, get some really deep cleansing in the skin. 
um, exfoliate deep down because they're using, those chemical peels are using a combination of salicylic acid, lactic acid, glycolic acid. Um, so when I talked about exfoliants, and I talked about AHAs and DHAs earlier, um, basically if you're having a chemical peel to the skin, usually there's like three levels, I would say. There's usually your kind of like your basic starter level, then there might be what's called a glow peel, and then maybe a power peel. And that just goes up in concentration. It might go from 3%, 7%, 14%. Um, but those you really have to protect the skin afterwards because they are kind of, I want to say blasting the dead skin off your your face, but they essentially are. Um, but they're great for illuminating the skin, um, really getting those dead skin cells off and just really creating beautiful, radiant, healthy looking skin. And it can actually address a lot of issues because all of those acids are going to help to uh, break up any type of scarring you have under the skin. So if you have like maybe previous acne scars, if you have a little bit of age spots, um, you know, sunspots, those types of things, those types of peels to the skin that use um, alpha hydroxy acids and beta hydroxy acids will really help to correct those issues. Great, Shannon. Thank you so much. Just being conscious of yeah. time, I want to point out that it's yeah. almost three o'clock, so I want to let students know that if they have another event to get to or another program or their program orientation and they have to go, that we are recording okay. the session. And before the end of the week, we're going to put it up on the OlgonquinCollege.com slash orientation website. So if you have to go, you will be able to watch the rest of the session. Shannon, if it's okay with you and you have the time, um, we can keep going yeah. for another five minutes to finish sure. up your presentation. Um, so for anyone who can stay, please do, please listen in, um, ask more related questions. But if you have to go, you'll be able to access the recording before the end of the week. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, which is a chart you mentioned. Yeah, so this chart here I put together, um, this has some of my favorite products here. And um, as you can see, just even by quick kind of reference, there's a lot of CeraVe that happens on this chart. Because again, it is a really great skincare line. It's cost effective, it's bland in the sense that it's not really gonna irritate your skin. Um, so I have it all divided by skin type here. Um, so for your normal skin, something like CeraVe Hydrating Cleanser is gonna be great. Um, toner, so this is a pixie toner that you can find at Shoppers Drug Mart and it's a nice glycolic acid. I think it's a 5%. And then CeraVe Moisturizing Lotion. This eye cream that I put here, the Ordinary Caffeine Solution, it is like amazing. And it is like maybe $7. And it's kind of like a serum in um, like a dropper, like a bottle that has like a dropper kind of tip to it. And um, yeah, you just lightly pat it on the eye area and it really helps to kind of um, tighten up that skin and just take away any type of puffiness. And then for sunscreen, so if you kind of just look across the whole way for sunscreens, I've only recommended two. There's obviously a million other ones out there that are great. Um, if your skin tends to not be overly reactive and you want something that is maybe more cost effective than the Avene that I've recommended, Neutrogena has a really great line of, of uh, sunscreens too. So you can definitely go for um, Neutrogena. And then for treatment, I just said uh, the Neutrogena Hydro Boost Hydrating Mask, you know, you can do that kind of once a week type of thing. For dry skin, um, we have the CeraVe again, the Hydrating Cleanser. Paula's Choice. So Paula's Choice is a really, really great skincare brand. And again, definitely easy on the pocketbook. The nice thing I like about Paula's Choice, it is only available online, but their website takes away all of the guesswork. You can shop by skin concern, you can shop by skin condition, like skin type. Um, they are great with their feedback, like if you have questions and you need to, you know, you whatever, you have questions and need recommendations, they're really, really great with providing that. Um, and I like that they offer full size and, and a trial size for almost everything. So yesterday I was looking and I was like, oh, I used to use Paul's Choice Cleanser years ago and I thought, I really did like it. I'm gonna go back to it and give it a go again. And of course they reformulated, so I can't find my favorite one, but they do offer it in like trial size. And I think it was maybe $4 or $5, so like a small trial size. So it's always great to try out skincare too. Um, and then Neutrogena Hydro Boost Gel Cream. There's that CeraVe eye cream. And I did list it a lot because it is my absolute favorite. And then yeah, just some more recommendations for sunscreen or treatment. For oily skin, we have Foaming Cleanser. 
Oily skin, there's a bunch of different toners you can use. Um, I did recommend the Ole Hendrickson. This is one that you'll find at Sephora, so maybe not the most cost effective, but definitely is top of the line if you have to control oil on the skin surface. So sometimes, um, obviously it's great to, to use things that are more affordable, and that is kind of my um, philosophy with skincare as well. I do listen to a podcast called The Beauty Brains, and it's two cosmetic chemists that do it and I absolutely love them and that's totally what they propose to everyone they're like you start with the cheapest line of skincare you can find that your skin can tolerate if you like it keep using it there's no reason for you to go to a $300 face cream you know so but you can but the Ole Hendrickson but sometimes you do have to kind of splurge a little bit if you really are targeting certain um, concerns or you have certain treatment areas you have to kind of control but this moisturizer I recommend under here this is amazing formula 1006 I use it in my kit all the time. When I went to high school, they were the most popular for like a toner, like, you know, kind of like a sea breeze type thing that we would use. But this moisturizer, I think is $9.99 at uh, Walmart. And it is amazing. So seriously, shine free. We use it all the time in our makeup kits. Recommended the fast response eye cream from MAC. That one has a lot of caffeine in it as well. Super great. Um, and then yeah, your skincare and then just the purifying clay mask from Sage is really great too. If you want to treat the skin. Uh, dehydrated, again, CeraVe Hydrating Cleanser. Um, this one here is another Sephora purchase, First Aid Beauty. But again, all of these types of products, like the oily toner and the, and the dehydrated toner, I'm pretty sure you can probably find a great option with Paula's Choice Online because they do offer skincare for every single skin type. Um, Water Bomb, it is one of my favorite moisturizers I ever, ever, ever use. It's a giant drink of water for the skin. Again, it's only available online. Um, if you want something similar, I think Neutrogena might have something similar where it's almost like a water gel formula. Great drink of water for the skin. And then CeraVe eye cream. And there you go with your SPF. And then for exfoliating, you do want to make sure that you're exfoliating dehydrated skin because you need to get that dead skin off. And sensitive skin. That's the Lumiere MD. That's that skincare brand um, from the uh, estheticians that I was telling you about. Oh, somebody had asked about estheticians. So I know Dermis Advanced Skincare. I think they still offer a Lumiere MD uh, for facials. So for estheticians, I do like them. I've gone there before. Um, and then I do like another company in Canada, though, that's still. It's called Charlotte K and Co. Okay, and then toner, Paula's Choice again, CeraVe Moisturizing Lotion, CeraVe Eye Repair Cream, Tizo Mineral Sunscreen. This is my favorite. When I apply sunscreen, um, I develop the craziest rash on my cheeks. Um, it is definitely um, a reaction or a sensitivity I have to chemical sunscreens. And Tizo, it almost looks like a, it's terrible. Like I have to use a medicated cream on it. Um, it's almost like a chemical burn I get from chemical sunscreens. So Tizo is like the only thing my skin does not react to. So that is definitely something I highly recommend. And then uh, the First Aid Beauty Ultra Repair Instant Oatmeal Mask. That's a great treatment one too. And then for Acneic, for CeraVe, I recommended a different cleanser. It's the SA cleanser. So it's a newer cleanser for them, maybe in the past year or so. It's salicylic acid. That's super gentle. The Thursday Plantation Tea Tree Toner, which I talked about briefly, um, and then Vichy Normaderm. Again, this isn't. This is definitely something that's available at shoppers, but it has to be a little bit more targeted um, and suitable for acneic skin because you do not want it. You do not want your moisturizer or any of your skincare to contribute to your skincare problems. So, with the Vichy Normaderm, you're getting salicylic acid with glycolic acid, so that the beta hydroxy and the alpha hydroxy, and that is gonna help to uh, go right deep down into the pores and clean them out. And then for the eye cream, we did the Ordinary, the Tizo Mineral Sunscreen, and then the First Aid Beauty, um, or the Sage Clay Mask would be a good mask too. This has been great, Shannon, thank you. This is so helpful for the students. Um, we're gonna okay. have to for another minute while we go through questions, so students wanna okay. screenshot this so they can remember all these great recommendations. There are okay. some questions about different products. So someone's wondering yeah. what a seaweed toner. Oh, I don't even know what a seaweed toner is. I'm sure it could be good, but I mean, it would depend. It totally depends on the, on the ingredient deck. And then another student's wondering about the Clinique brand. So Clinique brand is, 
is generally okay. I think we all, when I think of Clinique, I think of the three-step program and what I used to use, like the bar of soap with the toner and then the yellow lotion. Um, it, it's okay. I think you could get better results from probably even something cheaper. Um, I wouldn't use bar soap. I would definitely make sure that if you're going to do a cleanser, you would do some sort of like a liquid cleanser, something that's pH balanced for the skin. The toner, if you're going to use like their step one, step two, step three type thing, um, make sure you look at the back of the toner and make sure there's no alcohol in the toner because the Clinique toner used to have alcohol in it, which was something that we really did not suggest. And the dramatically different moisturizing lotion, which is that square yellow bottle, like it's good. It's, you know, it's basic, but I think, I think you could probably get similar results by using the CeraVe moisturizer. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. Have you heard of K-Beauty? Um, is that Kim Kardashian's line? Can Ali just verify if that's Kim Kardashian's line? Yeah, Ali, if you can type in the chat and confirm if that's, or Korean Beauty. Oh, Korean Beauty. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I thought you were talking about her. That's KKW, sorry about that. Um, in all honesty, Korean beauty is like their skincare routine is something that I think in the Western world, we're kind of adapting more and more now with all these steps. Um, I love Korean beauty. Like, I mean, the, the way that they, they baby their skin and they truly feed their skin. They have a different philosophy when it comes to skincare and it is all about nourishing the skin. Um, so I think it's really cool. I think, I think, I mean, other than the fact that Korean beauty, a lot of times is like 17 steps in your skincare routine. Um, if you have the time and you have the means, absolutely. It's, uh, you're definitely going to do great things for your skin, especially because in Canada, our elements are just so crazy. We go from like super hot to super dry and dehydrated. Um, yeah, the more products you can add to your skincare, if your skin can handle it, why not? Thank you, Shannon. And the next three questions are all related to, um, figuring out what your skin type is. Um, so mm -hmm. this is wondering what is the big difference between dry and dehydrated? So I would say dry is going to be more, um, it's more like thin and delicate. Like I feel like when somebody kind of like, if somebody smiles and they can kind of see like, you know, lines around either around their mouth or around like their eyes, you can kind of see it's almost like kind of crepey. Dehydrated is flaky for the most part. But, you know, dehydrated, you can have large pores and dehydrated skin. If somebody has um, oily dehydrated skin, that's kind of the most difficult to target treat because you're treating both the opposite ends of the spectrum um but yeah a dry skin i say usually you're kind of you're born with that your mom might have dry skin dehydrated is more like really flaky might be flaky around the nose flaky around the mouth flaky between the eyebrows um and that's a lot of times because of what we've done to the skin ourselves so we've used incorrect products or maybe we're inside and there's like dry you know hvac situation going on something like that and for students with normal skin, where should they follow on this chart? Uh, normal would be at the first line. Right. And for combination skin? Combination, it depends what your combination is. If you're dry and oily, you probably want to do something more in the normal line in terms of like cleansers, just so it's, you know, suitable everywhere. And then, um, Sorry, I just I'm I'm looking at the chat too, so I'm getting distracted. Okay, so if you're if you're like normal dry, then you're gonna want to do yeah, probably just the normal, and then any areas where you need a little bit more hydration, maybe have a moisturizer that's a little bit more, um, you know, emollient or a little bit more rich to use in those areas. And what about dehydrated and acneic? Um, dehydrated and acneic, so that's kind of tricky too. I'm gonna say. For that, you probably want to go with actually more of a sensitive type of skin line. So you're going to want to use a really sensitive cleanser. And then for your toner, you can use something that's probably more kind of calming for the skin. Because again, you don't want it to flare up, um, you know, any type of irritation to the skin. Um, and then moisturizer, if you're acneic, I would probably try, you could do the, Oh, you're not sensitive. You're just dehydrated and acne. So I would probably do probably like the Vichy Normaderm at night and then like a CeraVe in the day. You don't have to use the same moisturizer day and night. 
you can definitely target other areas. And while we're sleeping and we have all that like, you know, restorative downtime, if you put on more treatment based products, then I feel like they always work better than when you're going outside and, you know, they can kind of be destroyed by the free radicals out in the, you know, you're walking down the street type of thing. Great. Thank you so much. And the last question I'm going to ask is opinions on, and I'm going to brutalize. This. <laughs> yeah. We actually used that when I was in beauty school over 20 years ago. Um, you know what? I haven't really kept up too much with them um, in terms of a brand, but it really all comes down to the ingredient deck. Like what are they offering you in their moisturizer? Is there a lot of hyaluronic acid, which is going to help to attract moisture and uh, humectants to the skin um, or you know, is there, are they heavy in glycerin? It really just depends on, on what the actual individual product lists in their skincare. Awesome. Thanks so much. Let's head to the next slide, Hannah. Oh, okay. Yes. So back to, back to what we offer. So we are a group of tenured makeup artists. We do um, makeup all the way from, I mean, Ottawa area, like on the Quebec side too, like Wakefield all the way through Prince Edward County and we even have artists in Toronto as well. So we do makeup for weddings and special events, photo shoots, you know, we have a lot of personal, um, corporate and commercial clients and then we also do private and group makeup lessons, kind of like girls night in type things, which are really fun. And next slide. Oh, and there's me. Yeah, and this is just all of our information. So this is how you contact me if you have any questions. Um, there's my website. And then for social media, we just have all of our, all of the social media handles, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I guess that's it. Um, it's all just at One Fine Beauty. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Shannon, and to all of the attendees awesome. who joined us today on behalf of Algonquin College. If you're interested in re-watching the recording, this event and other event recordings from today are going to be up on the algonquincollege.com slash orientation website before the end of the week. So thank you again, Shannon. Thank you again to all the students. Enjoy the rest of AC Day 1. Thanks, everyone.